Hello, dear friends of a healthy digital ecosystem. On behalf of Eliant, I'm very happy to welcome you warmly to this conference. We hope to achieve throughout the workshops and the contributions, the panel discussions, to approach valid informations, supports, perspectives that every one of us, that's our hope, when we leave this evening, has maybe new encouragement and new ideas how to promote the best possible ways to help the children and youngsters of our next generations to find best conditions for their development in a more and more fully digitalized world. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker, that is Martin Reichertz, Director General for Education and Culture, followed by Thomas Fuchs, Professor of Psychiatry and Philosophy at Heidelberg University and Hospital, the University Hospital in Heidelberg. And we are very grateful that you agreed to inspire really the start of this conference with your two contributions. And then after that, we will bring the two in dialogue and in the last part, we open up to the panel. So thank you very much for joining us, Martin Reichertz. Great, thank you so much, uh, liebe Frau Doktor. <laughs> Michaela, ich bin Martin. Martin, I will speak English. I just, uh, I will just, since she speaks German, me too. So I'm Luxembourgish, that's why I also speak German. So it's not only the Swiss people who speak lots of languages, it's also some other countries in this world. Um, just a few words about myself, maybe because, and why I accepted this invitation, because I think, you know, you are an interesting uh, association. And so you, you, when I got to your invitation, people said to me, you know, why the hell are you going to talk to those people? And I answered, precisely because they are those people and because they are a little <laughs> bit outside of the usual scheme. So maybe you have seen my CV. Um, I'm, I'm a yoga teacher. I'm a, I'm a director general of the commission, but I'm also a yoga teacher. And I give yoga classes in the commission for seven or eight years now one class a week, which is already once, some, once in a while rocket science to achieve because, you know, I'm traveling a lot, so it's not always easy. But just to show that um, I think each of us is capable of changing the world. And I will start by talking about something completely different and which is not digital, but which is, which is the story and the parable of the colibri. Do you know the parable of the colibri? Who does? If everybody, I don't, okay, so it's, you do it too. Okay, so it's the story of a very small bird, the colibri, which is called the flybird or hummingbird in, uh, in English. It's a colibri, by the way, also in German, but with a K, so in French it's a C. And I will make it very short. It's, there is a fire in the jungle and you have all the animals who try to fight against the, the fire. So the elephant is coming in and taking huge amounts of water, etc. And after a while, you know, the, the, the animals give up because, you know, the fire, gets out of proportion, out of control. And the only animal who goes on is the colibri. We all know the size of the colibri. And at some stage, you have one of the big animals, the elephant saying the colibri, colibri, you know, why the hell are you going on? Because, you know, you see this is out of control. And then the small bird says, you know, I do what I can at my level. And that's why I think, for me, this is really one of the most important stories. I think we all have this feeling in today's world that we are, you know, completely overwhelmed by lots of things. And, you know, I'm a very optimistic person and I've been working on uh, this famous sentence of Socrates, you know, know yourself and you will know the world and the God or translations are a little bit different. I'm profoundly convinced that it's really important that to change ourselves is the first step to change the world, because otherwise it doesn't work. And unfortunately, it's very easy, you know, to blame the others instead of trying to see what we can do. And that's where I come back to the, to the question mark of, of, of today. When I joined DGA Act two years ago, and I have a long CV in the commission, in the usual papers, you know, the ones you read in Brussels, 
uh, it was said, you know, why the hell is this girl or this woman going to this underdeveloped DG? This is not one of the core functions of the European Union. And I was saying, because it was my choice, I had the choice between four DGs, and I said, I'm going to this DG because I can make a difference. And I'm very modest also, Frau Doctor. And I must say, two years ago, I made the difference. Two weeks ago, for the first time in the history of the European Union, in 60 years, the heads of states and of the 28 member states dedicated the whole lunch to education and culture. That has never happened. It's not only because of me, but again, coming back to the Colibri, I think it's really important that each and single of us, you know, try his best where he or she stands. And I think they talked about this. We'll see what comes out of the European Council. President Macron wants to make a European education area. I think we really need that one. Because again, you know, when you, you do not fall in love with a European Union because nobody knows what the European Union is about. You fall in love with people. You fall in love with an Erasmus program because that's about education. All the rest is just bullshit. But again, you know, I think our politicians are still very much functioning at the level of the minds. And I think sometimes, you know, when I talk to young people, some of you are young, some are less, and it's great also to see seniors in this room. The way from the head to the heart is sometimes very, very long. And sometimes it takes years to get there. I can testify, I was a very good student and it took me 40 years to understand that to speak with your heart is much more important than to speak with your head. And especially when you talk to young people, you cannot get young people on board if you talk to them like the oldies and the old politicians in today's world. That doesn't work. We need to change. And that's where digital also becomes, becomes important because that's their way of talking. I think when I hear very often youngsters are not interested in, in, in politics, that is not true. They are not interested in the way we handle politics for the time being. And that's why they vote for the extremes, whatever they are. They are just not interested in our model. My profound thinking is that we are at the end of a model. And that's where people like you, each of you, are important because we need to invent something else. I think for me, we are at the end of a system. And that's why we're trying also in what we are proposing for the digital world to insist much more on the soft skills. Of course, you can learn coding. You can learn all the brilliant things you will be talking about. But at the end of the day, critical thinking, trying to teach our kids to use the instruments, because whatever we think, you cannot prevent, prevent them from using those machines. Yesterday night, I had a discussion with my partner. His grandson is seven now. And the, the, his son is in a family whereby the kids have no devices before 10. So there are no devices. At, so the grandfather is unhappy about the situation. And, but OK, so it's the rule that has been decided by the parents. So he had a discussion with his grandson yesterday, seven years old. And then the, grand, the, the, grandchild, the child said to him, you know, I'll give you, I, I, I tell you secrets, but you shouldn't be telling papi and mummy, okay? And so he was starting to explain that, you know, his sister, which is two years older, has a girlfriend. And so they very often go to visit that girlfriend and they have, of course, I don't know, five computers at home, etc. And you know what? They teach the others to now to use the devices. So, they already understood that they shouldn't be talking to the parents because the parents would otherwise forbid them to go there. So they were talking to the grandfather, knowing that the grandfather also has, I don't know how many computers at home. And so suddenly he discovered that his grandson was quite good, seven years old, and he started explaining to the grandfather things that the grandfather didn't know, just because he had friends who had machines. So I think this is just a little story to tell you, I think whatever we think, and it's part of their life. And that's why we are working for the time being on what we will call a paper on digital that will come out, uh, which will come out uh, next year. I think it's important to find a system whereby 
our kids will not be slaves of, our, of their own devices. I think that's the thing we need to find out. And again, I think maybe the professor will teach us what we can do. We don't know. I think for the time being, the real answer is, I don't know. And I don't know if somebody knows, but we have lots of hints. So I think we have started work training them also in schools to use the Instagrams, the Snapchat, all those things to teach them, you know, not to post everything on Facebook. But I think if the kids open an account on Facebook, we all know that they just put, what is it, 14 years old, they just tick the box and then they get there. We know that 60% of the kids eight years old have already seen porn films. You know, all this is part of the reality. So we need, again, to teach our kids to use the instruments from kindergarten on, not necessarily the porn films, by the way, but again, you know, in a way, if they're confronted, confronted with this, we need, to, we need to teach them. This being said, to come back to figures, it's interesting to see that 44% of the Europeans have no or very low digital competences, which means that they are using the devices, but then they are the slaves of the devices, they don't know what's behind, and we need really to find a system whereby we get them, we get them on board. Ideally, and I think I'm pretty sure we have lots of parents here, that the parents should help their kids to, to, to develop their digital literacy. Very often it's the other way around. So again, I think we need to change completely the paradigm of teaching. Because very often, and I gave you the example of my friend and his grandchild, and the, and grandchild, they explain to us, you know, how the system works. And I know lots of parents and grandparents who learn to use Facebook to be in contact with their children and grandchildren. So I think this has changed completely the way, and I think this is more about sharing than about, about education. And that's why I think this is not only about education in the schools, this is about long life learning. Because we don't have to teach only the kids to use all those instruments. But we also need to teach all of you from three years old till 99. Because I think nowadays it's as important when you're 90 to understand the risks of internet than if you are three. And also to, to understand how this, this functions. And that's why we are in the process of presenting a new plan on the future of learning because we need to help member states to respond to the technology in education. And edu technology in education is not about using devices, because that's the easy part. It's about using it in a way whereby we help our kids to have a support. And when I look at kids still going to school with, I don't know, 10 kilos in their bags, I just wonder, you know, what the hell is this about? They all have devices and they all carry I don't know, all the books of the world. I'm frankly not against books because I think it's a real pleasure also to have a book. But in today's world, do we really need to get our kids to do this? And I think this is really important. The second thing which we are working on is a recommendation on common values. I think you cannot nowadays make forget about common values. I think too long, and coming back to what I said early on, for too long in Europe, we have been talking about economy. We have been talking about the euros. We have been talking about deficit. We have been talking about agriculture. We have been talking about great, uh, trade. Yesterday, everybody, uh, since yesterday, everybody is talking about glyphosate. I know your feeling about glyphosate. I share it, so I think it's not a problem. But again, you know, that's the kind of things where people drive mad. So we need also to talk about, you know, what unites us in Europe. Frankly, you know, in the 28, in the 30, but all over the world, what's the difference? And I see them so often. I was in Shanghai two weeks ago. What's the difference between a Chinese student and a European student? When you talk about values, there is nil. If you talk about languages, about religion, the way you call God or whoever, that's different. But if we talk about you know, what they're really interested in, in today's world, they listen to the same music, they watch the same movies, they, are interested, they fall in love, love in the same way, they live in democracies or not. And again, you know, in China, WhatsApp was not always functioning. Facebook was functioning in the hotel, but not outside of the hotel. So it's also interesting to see that democracy is not for granted. But I think all those things are really important. And that's why we will, talk, we will adopt in January a recommendation of common, val of common values, because we will have an education summit, the first of its kind, 
in, on January 29th. And I think this is the beginning of what we will call the Sorbonne process, because the idea is really to get Europe back in the education world to make sure that we can learn from each other. And I don't have to tell you, that's the base, one of the basis of your, in your fundamentals. But this is something we have forgotten in Europe. And that's why people like you, and I, I, don't, I don't share all of you, of your values, but lots of them, I think that's why people like you have to play Colibri, because we need you in today's society. We need a shift. We need to move from a purely liberal economic society to a society where heart will be at the center. Because if we don't get the human back in the center of society, it's not a question of, digit of digital, it's just a question of common sense. Let's come back to friendship, to love, to human, to, to just heart. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Michaela Klöckler, thank you very much for the invitation to this symposium, which I think is of utmost importance for uh, our future. Um, but uh, in order to look into the future, sometimes it might be good to look into the past, in particular to a um, representative of holistic learning, whom we all know, Heinrich Pestalozzi, and his famous uh, dictum of head, heart, and hand being necessary for integrated learning. Uh, you all know this, I'm sure, but uh, we know today uh, much better how uh, understanding, emotion, and action are actually one unity uh, integrated in the development of the human being. So cognition, emotion, and action work as a unity. That is the uh, summary of a new paradigm which has gained um, increasing importance in the last 10 and tw or 20 years, the paradigm of embodiment or embodied cognition. And this will be uh, the paradigm that I'm going to base my talk upon, um, which is quite in line, I think, with the etymology of uh, major um, uh, notions that we use in uh, teaching and learning. For example, Erfahrung, which of course comes from Fahren, that means to move and to drive or experience, which comes from experire, which of course means gaining knowledge and skills by moving through the world. That's the per of perire. So um, this is quite in line with the uh, paradigm of embodied and interactive learning. So this is, and that's what I, wanted to, what I want to show you, also the way in which the brain is shaped in learning, namely not by uh, downloading, not by being fed with information, but by being embedded in and adapting itself to constant interaction. So I'm going to present this view of embodied learning interacting with the world, and then I emphasize the specific human kind of learning, social learning, interacting with others, and then I um, um, give a look to digital media and ask for some of the consequences of this approach. Now, starting with embodied learning in general. Embodied cognitive science, here you find some authors, um, in particular Varela, since 1991, has, uh, has um, promoted this approach. Embodied cognitive science sees experience of the world as being constantly um, brought about through interaction. So we interact with the world and that is the way we perceive, we experience in integrated sensory motor loops. So human cognition is, according to this approach, inherently connected with bodily action. So we only perceive and uh, recognize what we somehow can interact with, what we can move towards, what we can grasp, what we can handle. Human cognition is inherently connected with social interaction because all objects that we recognize are objects that we, shared, uh, that, that we share with others in recognition. And it's inherently connected with emotional engagement. I'm going to show that in a bit more detail. 
The brain, again, is no hard drive or computer, but a relational organ that is formed through this ongoing interaction. And I give you some examples or experiments that show this um, shaping of the brain. The sensory motor cycles are which shapes the brain. And here's the uh, abstract schema where you see perception and action are inherently connected. Um, and the brain is inserted, is embedded in these ongoing cycles. That's its basic function, mediating the sensory motor cycles. But it is also shaped through them. And it's interesting that we can show this even in other, in other animals. And I uh, draw your attention to a very old experiment by Heldon Hein, but it's very telling. Heldon Hein uh, investigated spatial perception in newborn kittens. And they divided their groups of kittens in two groups. One active group, which you see on the left side, was able to move actively in a certain environment. But the other group was only carried around in the same environment. So they had this exactly self-same visual stimulation in their environment. But what happened? After about six weeks, um, the active group of uh, kittens was left free, and they could move around perfectly well and perfectly secure. But the other group, who was only carried around passively, who couldn't move, didn't, did have no spatial perception at all. They just stumbled around. They couldn't move in, in, a, in an oriented manner. They were completely without depth perception. So I think this is a very important experiment. Um, and it shows that space and depth perception depend on an active organism, on a moving body. And the brain is formed through these loops of sensory motor interaction. Merely visual or only two-dimensional stimuli do not constitute the spatial world. And we could even say they do not constitute the world because our world is basically a spatial world that we can move, in uh, that we can move towards and in, into, and that we can interact with. Another experiment, more recent one, Sir and colleagues um, uh, did a rather in, um, invasive experiment with newborn ferrets, which you see, these uh, nice animals. They rewired the optic nerve. And you have to keep in mind that ferrets are also blind at birth, like the kittens. They rewired the optic nerve and, and connected it with the auditory brain center. So you would imagine that nothing happened and the, and the ferrets couldn't see. Of course they couldn't see. But after a while, after again a couple of weeks, the repeated visual motor stimulation which the retina and the brain and the whole organism uh, um, experienced turned the auditory brain center into a visual center. So the brain adapted to the visual motor interaction with the environment so the ferrets could see with this eye, although it originally projected to the auditory cortex. And this clearly shows a quite uh, important, um, para um, quite important uh, rule. The form follows the function, you could say. Or in other terms, the function, through its embodied execution, creates its suitable cerebral organ. The brain adapts so to enable an increasingly better function, but only through the executed function. Or in other, in other words, interaction with the environment creates the neural conditions of experiencing it. I think that is also a very clear, um, uh, a, a very clear uh, telling experiment. And a third one, in this case, a more human-like experiment, you can uh, um, think of training to play a melody on the piano. Uh, just a simple melody. And this establishes sensory motor links in the brain after a couple of training, of training sessions. That means, and that has been shown by uh, a brain EEG uh, investigation, that merely listening to the melody after these training sessions already leads to a subliminal 
uh, activation of motor brain centers and the according finger muscles. So you hear the, the melody and your, your body is already engaged, so to speak, without actually moving. And the other way around, you play the keys on the silent piano, you play the melody without hearing, but this activates already your auditory centers and you kind of inner, have an inner listening of the melody. Of course, this is perfected in, in pianists or in, in, in musicians. But in any case, even in uh, lay persons, this leads to an in-depth learning. The learning is embodied, so to speak, and to an enhanced memorizing. And of course, to an embodied perception, because you hear the melody with your body, so to speak. Your body is engaged in hearing the melody. And these intermodal links are particularly important for an in-depth learning, that means for a long-lasting embodiment of, experiment, of, of experience. Now I wanted to show that in human learning, the interaction with others is the second major column, so to speak, of development. And this, of course, starts in early childhood with the relation of the baby to her caregivers or to the mother and father. There's a dyadic engagement first. So our external objects do not play a major role at first, but already these face-to-face -face interactions lead to an intense social resonance and to learning processes. Proto-conversation, a turn-taking pattern that the child learns and already is, prepares the child for later linguistic interaction. So the one uh, follow, uh, replies to the other, but not by words, but by utterances or gestures. Imitation plays a major role already in uh, very early childhood. Soon after birth, children are able to imitate the uh, simple expressions of others as shown in this picture. And this, of course, leads to a resonance between the bodies to feeling the familiarity, the similarity of the other's body, and feeling with him. An activation of social resonance and mirror systems in the brain is uh, brought about, and links, again, perception and action, but now not with, a, um, not with a tool or an object, but perception and action of the other. The other's action is my own action in, uh, in, in, in Statun Ascendi, so to speak, and vice versa. And in this way, children acquire very early on effective interactive patterns or schemes of being with, as they have been told, uh, as they have been called in uh, infant research. Uh, their, effect, their effect attunement and basic empathy is trained from the first weeks on. And it is important to see that this is not just a, a screen-like experience, experience, but there is turn-taking and there is also matching between the states of baby and mother and mismatching. It's not all the time completely harmonious, but there are slight, slight misunderstandings that have to be repaired. So there's a kind of alterity of resistance in the interaction as well. It's not complete harmony, and that is good, because then the child learns to interact with the mother as another person. Okay, let's go on. From the eighth to ninth month, ninth month uh, a decisive uh, change um, appears, namely the opening of the dyadic engagement to triadic engagement uh, with the famous term joint attention. Um, you know the work of Michael Tomasello. Pointing and gaze following, as in the example here, lead to a shared relation to external objects. So that means the primary diet is kind of opened up to the, to the world and uh, a, a shared intention, a shared directedness to objects comes about. And this, as Tomasello has shown, can be seen as the crucial human way of learning, which is not possible for any higher animal. And um, this has been confirmed by recent uh, uh, concepts of the so-called natural pedagogy, developed by Srebra and Gergely. Natural pedagogy means that the child and the mother are tuned, 
are attuned to a certain way of instruction. There are innate dispositions for interactive learning in both the mother and the child. Uh, this is particularly obvious from so-called ostensive cues. That means a certain gazing towards the child, looking at the child, raising the eyebrows, motheries language, singing-like language, and that points out to the child, well, pay attention, this is something important. This is generally important. And this can be shown already in the, uh, in the, second, uh, in the second half of the first year of life. Human-specific form of communication leads to a learning that is generalizable, that shows the child, well, this happens usually, and this should be done. Through interactive dialogue, natural pedagogy is implemented. And if we go further on, and again we arrive at, uh, as, at a stage which um, Tomasello calls the collaborative stage at about uh, 12 to 15 months, here what comes about uh, is the sharing of action plans between the, the caregiver and the child and the possibility to distribute roles and to reach a shared goal through collaboration. This is again a specific human, uh, specifically human feat and it's brought about not just by cognitive means but, as, but uh, by a specific human motivation, namely altruistic motivation. Uh, human babies want to share something. They want to share the emotion they feel. They want to share intentions. They want to help others if they realize that he uh, doesn't succeed in doing something. They want to share goals and actions. That is what is most fun, that what, what brings most fun to them. And that, interestingly, is also what has been shown to be the best condition for establishing lasting neural networks in the brain, because that is not just a information-based uh, feeding with information or data, but it is crucially mediated through emotional and interactive experience. So nothing is uh, sedimented in a similar manner as uh, an experience that is interactive and that is emotionally satisfying. This was a short look at the basic mechanisms, or ra rather avoid the term mechanisms, let's say at the basic processes of le learning in early childhood. But they are important and they are confirmed by um, learning language because also language learning proceeds in triadic interactions and situations. It's interaction with objects, and this is connected with the triadic um, um, uh, situation, pointing and naming the object. So interacting is the basis for language comprehension. And this is even borne out in neuroscience research, but because still, each verb, for example, that we speak or listen to already activates the networks in the premotor cortex that are necessary for, for performing the activity. So again, we have an in inherent connection between the uh, seemingly abstract word and the action that is connected to the word. So language is embodied, language is active and interactive as well. It's not just an abstract symbol system. And this uh, leads me finally to uh, quite another um, uh, research, but a confirming research, which you all know, I think, and that is the research by John Hattie, which came out in 2008 and 11. Uh, Visible Learning is the famous book, and Hattie uh, analyzed 800 meta-analyses and, and, and altogether 50,000 studies on what makes up a good school education. And you know, I think the result, the result is not that there is any particular method or it's the size of the, of the classes. No, it's the teacher as the person which is, who is the most important factor. And this confirms all that we know about uh, learning in early childhood. Individual learning, for example, with digital media, is not uh, significantly more effective than other kinds of learning. And that is the next result. And the teacher, according to Hattie, should not be a mere coach, a facilitator, 
a standby person, so to speak. No, he should be active, interactive. He should be an activator, leading the process, structuring the process. You remember the ostensive cues of natural pedagogy. These are all directed towards the other in a personal way. And he should be tangible as a person. Of course, not just um, uh, talking his programmed um, ideas, he should uh, certainly take the student's perspective, ask for their feedback, so really interactive learning, but uh, a warm and respectful attitude is the emotional atmosphere that is most um, beneficial for the learning process. So we see um, this confirms, I think, much of or most of what you're engaged in and it also confirms the basic processes of learning in early childhood. What is uh, the difference when we look at digital media now? Let us look at the two um, aspects. First, sensory motor aspect, second, social aspect. Digital media you remember the kitten experiment with the with the um, just being um, being presented with uh, with flat surfaces with visual data. Well, you have it here. Uh, digital media have a two-dimensional surface. They have no depth you can walk into. You can there's no uh, embodied interaction which is possible. There's a rapid change of stimuli of pictures and situations. And sometimes defendants of these um, uh, plays or digital media um, point to the uh, training of attention that would be possible here. But the, 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 the opposite is actually the case. What is trained is not attention, but distraction. You're distracted by all kinds of stimuli and, and pictures that come up immediately, and you do not learn to concentrate constantly to... Um, to um, to inhibit uh, distractions, so you, tr you, you learn to distract yourself. And there's, of course, what we can call a disembodiment taking place. Minimal bodily activity and minimal intermodality. You remember the importance of multisensory interaction for, em for embodied and in-depth learning. Fixation of the eye direction and eye focus. So there's again no interaction, no moving towards, it's just a fixed um, screen uh, relation that you have. And what the experience completely lacks is any kind of resistance and weight. Weight and resistance are most important for embodiment. Let's see what is going on here in contrast. On this picture, you see the boy opening the tap. Uh, so here is learning through interaction. The boy has to keep balance, coordinating his trunk and the arm movements all the time um, while he is doing this uh, a bit complicated uh, opening the lever. Then uh, the, the, the tap, so then he experiences agency. He experiences the resistance of the tap and uh, the efficacy that is, uh, that is the result of his action. And of course, there's intermodal sensory motor experience, not only seeing, but also uh, the kinesthetic experience, the experience of the water flow flowing down, the experience of the temperature, of the fluidity of the water with the hand, and also the possibility to spill the water with the hand. All this is part of a unitary embodied experience. But we should also think uh, that this is, uh, we should keep in mind that this is the basis for later abstractions. You remember how we calculate? We calculate with the fingers um, uh, at first. We learn to calculate with the fingers, and that is the, is the lasting contribution of embodiment to abstract mathematical uh, capacities. And it's, all, it's similar in all other kinds of abstraction. Abstraction is not just a symbolic level, but it is literally abstracted, drawn from the primary, concrete, embodied experience. So even the laws of falling bodies would never be understood if we, I wouldn't know what falling and what gravity and what weight is. 
So all logical and abstract operations are ultimately based on sensory motor experience. This is an insight that has already, fundament, uh, already been fundamentally emphasized by Piaget, of course, but we know today uh, through developmental psychology and through neuroscience uh, how, uh, how uh, definitely this is true. One might say, uh, children, well, will always learn to move upright and to climb stairs, of course, even if they use uh, digital media all the day. But the fine motor skills that are necessary to use tools, for example, like pencils or scissors or, the, or, the, or a pencil, and to explore the world in more detail, are only learned through interaction. And impaired motor skills have also a negative impact on cognitive and social learning, as we know today. And interesting examples are the cases of developmental coordination disorder uh, in about 3 or 4% of children, which leads also to impaired school performance. So there's a connection between motor skills and, for example, mathematical skills but also leads to peer, uh, impaired peer relations and to social dysfunctioning in these children. So there's a tight and holistic um, connection between, uh, between cognitive, embodied, and emotional social experience. Let's look at the cognitive structure of digital games for a short moment, uh, here shown in a picture. Digital games emphasize process and speed and the mechanism of what is going on over against content and meaning of what is going on. The meaning is virtually nil, uh, but the attention is all the time distracted to uh, upcoming stimuli and you could even say this trains precisely not attention but attention deficit disorders. Uh, because you are um, trained to be distracted by all kinds of upcoming stimuli and events, uh, and that is what you should learn best. So the opposite of concentration and focusing. And there's a total absorption in the here and now, a blinding out of any past and future, which means, neurobiologically speaking, uh, complete underfunctioning of prefrontal cortex um, um, uh, activity, and there's, on the other hand, an overstimulation of dopaminergic reward systems. All this is very, very re rewarding, and that's what, why the child does it, uh, and possibly uh, addictive. And of course, in the, as a result, analogic games get rather dull. So that is part of our sensory, um, ex of our sensory endowment, so to speak, that we are, uh, that we are. Um, that we are beings that are distracted by uh, optical and visual stimuli coming up somewhere immediately. Uh, and that is, that is good, of course, because we had in uh, archaic times, we had to react quite quickly to uh, upcoming uh, dangers, for example. But if this is trained and uh, becomes the, the, the focus of my, of my attention over, over uh, hours, then, of course, we train exactly the opposite of concentration. And analogic um, uh, games, analogic uh, slower games become necessarily dull. Let's look at the social structure of digital media then. There's, of course, a lack of bodily resonance, of eye contact, of interaffectivity. Even on Facebook and on other um, interactive um, media, you're not able to, um, to interact in this subtle and immediately uh, inter-affective way with others. There's always a detour, so to speak. In social networks, the emphasis is on self-presentation instead of spontaneous interaction. And there is, that is most important, no triadic interaction. You remember the triangle of pointing towards objects, jointly collaborating with objects, that is not possible in digital media. There's no joint attention towards something. And uh, there is a multiple, uh, what, what we find in, in, in the studies is that there is indeed a multiplication of contacts, a multiplication of social communication, but at the price 
of a deeper relationship. There are lots of uh, interconnections, but they, are go don't, uh, they don't move into the depth of an, uh, of an intimate relation. And, of course, uh, the result is a frequent fear of social inclusion, uh, of social exclusion, and the fear of getting offline, literally off the line of others. It might be also be interesting to look at a study of P uh, in 2012, which shows that after face-to-face -face discussion on a movie in groups of three persons who discussed the movie with each other in spontaneous and embodied interaction, the memory of the event and the memory of the movie was significantly better than when, this, when these groups uh, had only digital in exchange. So three, group, uh, th three person groups with digital exchange um, lead to worse memory um, uh, structure than uh, in an in, in, uh, embodied interaction. Well, I could tell you lots of uh, studies on the effects of extensive media use, and I leave that aside for a moment because these are all um, um, results that are more or less uh, um, more or less known. Reduced performance at school, less satisfaction, increase of attention deficit disorders, increased obesity. Um, I only want to look at a study that recent, came out recently although not all results are published yet, and that is the Blick Media Study by the German government. First results came out in this year, and it's a, a huge study with 5,500 children um, over two to 13 years of age. The results are here. Children below six years with extensive media use, and this starts already at over 30 minutes, these children show significant deficits in concentration and language acquisition, hyperactive activity, and um, uh, what is to be expected, inability to play for longer times. So there has to be a quick exchange or a quick change to other objects, to other plays, because they cannot keep with a play for longer time. The same is um, found in eight to 13 years olds, um, if the media use is over one hour per day, and uh, you'll find also similar results, and in addition, uh, significant overweight. And a final study that I found interesting is an American study, uh, a meta-analysis of 72 studies on empathy between seven, uh, 1980, or 1979, and 2009, so over 30 years. Um, 72 studies were analyzed and compared, and Conrad and um, co-workers found that the empathic capacities in American college students showed a decline of over 40% 40 uh, during these 30 years, but with a major drop occurring in the samples after the year 2000, which may, of course, uh, indicate a change in social interactions and social relations and a shift from immediate, embodied, spontaneous interaction to uh, digital and media interaction where the uh, interbodily resonance is significantly reduced and impaired. To conclude, three uh, theses Holistic learning means learning through understanding, feeling, and acting in unity. All three capacities are engaged in a child's embodied interaction with the environment. And these manifold sensual and bodily experiences may neither be replaced by media nor by a computer. And grasping, in this sense, is literally the basis of all comprehending. Uh, greifen is the basis of begreifen. And uh, third, excessive usage of digital media may have severe consequences for children's cognitive, emotional, and social development. And now we should, of course, talk about the consequences. But here I restrict myself to some um, first ideas or hints, because that is a major uh, domain of uh, pedagogy and teachers, and I'm not the expert in this room here, but I think what, uh, what, is, what, what uh, suggests itself is, of course, a renaturalization of childhood 
and the importance of jointly playing outdoors, because that is, of course, the best training of sensory motor and interactive and cognitive skills that children can have. Then we have to think about an age-related restriction of media use without demonizing media because that makes them all the more attractive. As we all know, um, we, one could uh, talk about uh, 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 no digital media, um, so um, just starting with digital media, not before the age of, uh, before school age, restricted usage uh, in the uh, further a course of childhood or adolescence, but that remains uh, open for discussion. But what I think is most important is not just a negative, but a positive approach. We have talked about that yesterday already in the preparation group, offering attractive alternatives. Um, offering attractive alternatives, for example, through interactive play, um, uh, nature uh, exploration, and all kinds of things that really can fill the gaps that we find in many childhood uh, environments because the gaps and the empty spaces are what draws digital media, uh, what attracts digital media, as we all know when we have pauses and look at the, at the smartphone. So gaps, empty spaces is what attracts digital media. And what we should do is certainly promote holistic methods of education that means multisensory, interactive, explorative uh, methods, which are based on the teacher as a person, as I've already pointed out. And I don't want to conclude without uh, this wonderful picture and relief, uh, where we go far back in history, but I think, <laughs> I hope also into the future, because you see here this wonderful a situation of social interaction with the, there are three children, one, two, three, and you see the fine um, gestures and the fine holding by Eknaton and Nofretiti of, of their child, and the child, and the, and the children are pointing. All three children are pointing, as you, the, as you see. Points here, this child points there, and even this child on the shoulder points. So they are sharing this situation through through joint attention, through the triangle uh, in which now the other person is included, and that is perhaps the climax of joint attention if it is directed to other human to other human beings. So I think this is a very moving picture, and you could even say uh, it is taking place outdoors because you have the sun uh, shining over these <laughs> over these uh, over the couple and her children. So thank you very much for your attention. We are now, because we started a bit late, advanced in our time, but I would really love to open the discussion between the two of us, at least for 10 minutes, and first ask Martin Reichertz, is there anything you would like to ask to Mr. Fuchs and the other way around? Is there anything after having listened to the contributions you would really like to ask? Now, I have a question to you because I think I come back to the example of my friend and the grandchild. I think all this is great and we know about the dangers of digital and all this I think you know is, is the result of evidence etc but I think if we f if we follow you at the end of the day we need to take you know to take the digital away and I think in a way that's one of the points I don't share with you I think we cannot prevent our kids to have the the, the devices so my question t to you is you know how can we mitigate the risk and because that's at the end of the day, you know, I think who doesn't have a, a mobile phone here in this room? Great, congratulations. Okay, but uh, you know, this is still the exceptions. And I think we cannot, I, I'll tell you another example. When I was a kid, my parents didn't want a TV. 
And I did exactly what the grandson was doing. We were watching TV at the neighbor's place. So at the end of the day, we did less, but we still did. Because when you are in school, you need to talk to the others and you share about the experiences you have had with the television or with the device, etc. So for me, in a way, how can we mitigate the risks? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I didn't uh, um, put up a suggestion of uh, doing away with, with digital media at, um, and, and, and Toto. So uh, that was certainly not my idea. And I agree that um, at, at the latest at school, um, children are confronted with, um, with a peer group where digital media, where smartphones are uh, common. And uh, it's no use to stay away from the smartphones uh, until 12 years or whatever and be excluded in this way. That, that we wouldn't do anything good for our children, I think. But nevertheless, during childhood and during kindergarten or during um, uh, the first years, I don't see why it should be necessary because here the child is mostly um, integrated and interacting with, uh, within the family or within uh, very near um, groups of friends. And uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't see why it shouldn't be possible to, to, um, to renounce uh, or to do away with uh, smartphones in the, in the uh, proximity of children. I, uh, later on, uh, things change, of course. And um, I'm not sure if we need something like digital literacy because um, uh, the, the term literacy is originally de derived from um, being a person who, who can read and write and uh, somehow able to interact with, um, with, um, with uh, intellectual information, so to speak. Um, but um, digital um, competence, I would rather say, is something which children acquire best by themselves uh, that, is already, that is at least my experience. And uh, they are acquired uh, gradu gradually, and it is possible to interact with them and talk, talk with them about their experience. That, I think, is the most important thing. Not to leave them alone with these uh, instruments, with these devices, but um, interacting with them, talking with them about these, uh, their experience. And uh, that mitigates, I think, quite a lot. But uh, still, I'm not sure uh, whether we need all this during primary school and shouldn't uh, postpone the first um, inclusion of digital media into uh, later years of school. And there, again, in certain, um, tech in, in certain situations where it's, where it's important to use the, uh, the tool of computer, of the internet, for a certain goal. I think. Again, uh, as I said, I have, you know, my nephew is eight years old and so I can see uh, how complicated it is. And I spent a week with him uh, this summer and uh, we have, I have a little apartment in Jean Lepin, the French Riviera, and there is no Wi-Fi in this apartment. There is no television. And so we did spend a week without a device. And of course, you know, we found back the time in the evening to read a story and to play with the games and, you know, all this we did for a week. And so there is no disagreement mm. on, on the fact that, you know, it, it's really important to have phases where you are not connected. This being said, in my experience, and, you know, I live in the normal world, when I look, first of all, he went back home and immediately switched on television and mother gave him, you know, all this. So... This was a kind of brackets week because I function a little bit differently. But I think the society as such is not like this and they have devices. And so my question mark is, you know, how to really accompany them so that they learn, you know, how to use those machines. Because in a way we can, you know, close our eyes and say they shouldn't be using it before they are 12. Okay, great. Reality is that's not the case. Because even if yours have not, they go visit friends, as I did with my, uh, to watch TV when I was a kid, and Zorro was the movie I was looking at, you know, I knew them all. And so kids find the tricks. So I would say, and again, coming from my rebel experience, because I'm a rebel, a rebel uh, for me, it's more helpful to explain to me what the risks are, even if I'm a kid, 
than to forbid something because if it's forbidden, it's even more interesting. So again, you know, how to, and this is a question of education, it's not a question of, or, you know, how to be parents, how to be good teachers, and again, you know, I think they also need to make their own mistakes because that's the way we have all been learning, unfortunately, because that's the way you learn walking. You fell, we fell how often? So again, you know, I, I'm not at ease because not because not because I disagree with you. I agree with you, but can we prevent and can we protect our kids from all dangers? I would say we have to to find ways to work with them, but we cannot put them in a bubble because the bubble doesn't exist anymore. We are not in a village somewhere in the middle of Africa. Uh, thank you very much for your explanation, which is really clear of where the problems are and the consequences. It's, there is no doubt here, it's very rich. I have got a feeling here that there is actually one element missing. We are missing the person actually or who creates this digital media and all of these devices. Because we have got the results, we have got also the people who could make the rules, but we don't really understand how this is being uh, presented to us and how we could work with them because we could see the floods of this which is based on consumerism, money and all of this and uh, I don't know, they also have good children, those people that will probably will suffer at some point. So the question is could we include the creators of these products or devices to be in the same dialogue because we feel that we are, they are in a complete isolated uh, uh, island, really. Thank you. That's a very important question if in Brussels is such a triangulation between inclusive Google and co. So I think you will because not Bill be satisfied with my answer. So they are associated. Yes. But uh, again, you know, when you talk to the people from Google, Microsoft, and you name them, their main concern and what they are looking for, and they are organizing coding weeks. And they start coding at a very early age. So that's their recommendation, and that's where we start, where, you know, and there again, frankly, I think that it's, it's not about coding, because what kids have to understand, and there I disagree with you, is that, and I disagree, and I will tell you why I disagree with you, because when I, and in my experience with kids, of course they learn by themselves how to, how to use the, the machines. But what they don't understand, and that I've seen very clearly with my nephew, is that behind the machine, there has been a human person who was coding. And for me, one of the major issues is to find ways to explain to those kids that there is a whole machinery behind all this, and that you can, influence the way it is being coded. And I think that link is the link which is not about coding, because coding is something in 10 years' time we'll do it differently, because it will be more intuitive, it will be something. But to explain to our youngsters that, in, in, and there are, Lego has developed lots of tools like this, to explain to them that they can have an influence on the way it functions. And this is not a purely passive thing. This is something where we can go on. But again, you know, on the triangle, as you said very rightly, when you talk to the main actors, their main objective is to get, to get more people involved. And their second main objective is to get people who are trained in IT and to increase the number of youngsters who are ready to go for being an IT architect or whatever, which is maybe not a bad trend, because I'm pretty sure that at some stage, as we know, the system itself will also develop people in the IT world that function our way. <coughs> but this will take a while. I think this is not something which will be overnight. So we work with them. They are very influential, as I'll take another example, as Monsanto is, because they're very powerful. And when you look at the way Bill Gates made a fortune, out of his own machines and now he's reinvesting in a different way, at the end of the day, you know, what is white, what is black? It's complicated. I think there is no real answer to that kind of questions. A second question. Don't we need 
Digital free oasis for children in kindergarten and in the primary school for compensating the overwhelming power of digitalization around the world. I told you the personal story which I had with my nephew. Again, so I think you don't have to convince me. Uh, this being said, I think in the kindergarten, uh, for the time being, it's still relatively reasonable. Uh, at the level of primary school, it's getting a little bit more complicated. But again, if you use a device as a book, and if they read on the device instead of reading in the book, that's not the problem. I think if they start playing, that's something else. Because then, of course, the, the tri-dimensional the, the tri dimensional exercise is, is, is leaving. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I think we cannot preserve our kids from, the, from life as it is because I think they also need to make their own experiences. And we can create whatever in the families. This being said, you know, you are convinced about this, but you are not the majority, if I may say. You will maybe be one day, but at this stage, I think this is not the major trend. And since we're still in a democracy, you know, I would love to say this is possible because, of course, it's feasible. But this will never find a majority at this stage. So I think, again, it's the story of the Colibri. Everybody has to start at his or own level. But again, you cannot oblige a whole system in today's world to move along lines like this. And again, you know, but the real thing is, and that's something also which I'm really convinced about, Education, management is about leading by example. How can we explain to kids that they shouldn't be playing with the machine if you have the devices on the table when you're having lunch or dinner? Well, How many of us do it? You know, I oblige now the people who are in my office, if I see them on the machine, I said, you know, are you working, are you talking to me or are you playing with your machine? But again, you know, it's also just a question of being polite. So should we come back just to common sense? Because it's not only the child who are completely polluted by digital. <laughs> it's all of us, or maybe not all of you, but I am too. And that's why once in a while, I have a period whereby I don't take this machine out. And I, I was on a yoga weekend this weekend in Banneux, somewhere next to Liège, and I didn't touch the phone for two days. But even that is not always easy, because you have this feeling that maybe there's something going on. Maybe there is a major catastrophe somewhere. So it starts again, as I said earlier on, by us. But you cannot exclude, our, you know, and, and kids need to learn. You could um, still uh, close the primary school from uh, active uh, usage of digital media. So uh, that, that would still be possible. I think that is a politi political question. And a pedagogic question, oh, yes. So, um, if you argue for um, for the detrimental effect of digital media in, uh, in early childhood and in uh, during primary school, then that it might still be possible to exclude it from normal uh, class uh, education, wouldn't you think? It is possible, but I will never get a majority of ministers on this one. Really? I can. I, I can. Yeah. You know, and again, you know, politics is all also about, you know, looking at what's possible and not possible. Mm. I think in some member states, again, mm. not in all of them, mm. and it's interesting to see that southern member states are less active. So mm. I think it's interesting because we will see how this ends up in the development of our kids. But I think ask an Estonian kid, a minister, to say that he will forbid dig digital devices in schools. Forget about it. It's just a non-go. I think, again, you know, we can dream of a world, and that's great, but I think at some stage, you know, the interesting thing here is maybe at some stage to see the results. Mm -hmm. Because again, you know, in the southern member states, they are less digital. That's the reality of life, for good or bad reasons. Yeah. And again, we will see in five, six years' time, you know, if there is an influence or not. And again, you know, the story of uh, hyperactivity, I can testify. You can look at, you know, again, my nephew, eight years old, and he's playing with the machine. He's just, you know, very aggressive. Again, a week without, he was, you know, he was like an angel. Mm -hmm. When I told his mother, mm -hmm. he was back to bases again. Because, but how can I convince her? It's her son. It's not mine. So, you know, my personal opinion is I can teach this kid for a week's time that you can live differently. That's what I can do, Colibri. 
But at the end of the day, he goes back, and it's my brother and my sister-in-law. You know, I can organ not organize a war for, for, for every single thing. So, and that's the same in, at, at the bigger level. So I think we need those kind of paradises where this is feasible with the people who are ready to, go, to do so. But it's not a model we can impose for the time being, at least to the universe, because in China, in Japan, you know, they start in the, in the morning already. And some of us do too. So again, how far do we go? We are extremely grateful for your honesty. That happens. And also to show us how to overbridge mainstream democratic attitudes with the Colibri system, which I'm sure no one of us will forget. So thank you so much for coming. No, I thank and you. I really hope we will make something out of it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And go on. We need you.